Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of christ i stand In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Amen to that. The power of Christ. Welcome everyone. We are happy you're with us for our service today. Our call to worship is from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout to the rock of our salvation. Let's shout together today. I count on one thing. But the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now he won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out he's working all things
nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. That nothing can stand against. I choose to praise. God of creation. You are the God of redemption. You are the one that has brought us here today. We wouldn't be here without you. You're the one who loves us beyond our imagining. We take a step back and we fathom how you've put all things together so that you could draw us to you. God, we just praise you and we lift you high. God, you know, for each one of us this morning, we're in a lot of different places. For some of us, this is a really good day. And for those others of us, this has been a brutal week. And we pray that these next moments that we spend together, that you'll draw our attention to you, that you draw our attention to your love for us, and that you'll draw our attention to how you want to work in us and through us. God, this is your time, and we praise you for it. We thank you for being here amongst us. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, everybody, it is good to be with you this morning. And uh, it is Doug and I, and we are coming to you uh, via recording because Doug and Melissa are in Ohio this weekend, and Gwen and I are actually up in Steamboat. So at our 20th anniversary, you all on the journey were incredibly generous and you gave Gwen and I a trip to see the fall colors out east. And then COVID hit. And, you know, those pesky states back in, uh, you know, Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine, New York, they all want COVID tests before you can come out and, uh, and see their colors. So we, uh, we decided we put a little pause on that. We're going to hopefully be there next fall. And this fall... We are taking the opportunity to, to head up to Steamboat for the weekend. So that is why we are meeting with you uh, virtually this morning. And we just want to thank you for your flexibility with us in that this morning. Thank you. However, we do have a few announcements before we get into the rest of the service. And the one that is like right off the top that I want to be able to express to you and I'm going to ask you to pray about. And that is uh, that this past week, uh, Lydia Young has agreed to be uh, part of our lead team, to be able to step into the shoes of Patty Tillian. So we're just really excited about that. So the way things work around here at The Journey is when somebody's name gets brought forward, um, we talk about it at the lead team, and when the lead team is in approval or you know, in agreement on that, then we bring it toward the congregation, those that are part of The Journey and call The Journey to their home. And then we get it out there for two weeks and to be able to you know, answer any questions that anybody might have about that. And then after two weeks, uh, if everything goes smoothly, then we simply ask for the approval of the congregation, and then we install and commission uh, that person into that role as a, a lead team member. So we're really excited about that, to be able to have Lydia be able to step into this role, and uh, we pray for and we just ask that you pray about that over the course of the next couple of weeks. And now we don't have a lot of other announcements, so I want to just jump to the things that we are supporting this week uh, with our tithe. Uh, every, every Sunday as we give our gift center offerings, if folks are here 
that you are able to give it in the back boxes. Otherwise, um, you can see, you can be able to text to give or go online and give. But every week that we, uh, that we receive God's gifts on your behalf, we always take a portion of that from the journey and we give that to ministries outside of the journey. And this week, uh, we are actually splitting that tithe. And this week, it goes to our Mission and Ministry Fund and to Young Life, St. Brain Valley Young Life. So the Mission and Ministry Fund is one of those funds that we take the opportunity uh, to support people with short-term missions or if there's a particular project that's going on that we can help support. And uh, one of the things that we just had recently, a couple of weeks ago, is we had Max Burris come in. And Max Burris is, uh, is working with the University of Wyoming with Navigators. Navigators is a college ministry, uh, beyond college, but uh, they're a college ministry up at the University of Wyoming in Laramie. And uh, Max Burris, a local Longmont boy, is, uh, is involved in full-time ministry with them. And we've taken a portion of that ministry and mission fund that we've developed over the year and are giving that to support his work on, uh, in that short-term uh, ministry. So we're glad to be able to do that. Also, we're supporting uh, St. Brain Young Life. Uh, we've got a really intimate relationship with uh, St. Brain Young Life. There's a lot of folks that are part of the journey that have been a part of that ministry, and we're really grateful uh, to be in that partnership with Young Life. One of the things that was really cool is I just met with uh, Timmy Conrad, who is one of the leaders of St. Brain Young Life, and the reason he met with me is not only to be able to say thanks to the journey for all the help over the years and for partnering, but they are investigating doing ministry with Front Range Community College, which obviously is right next door, right here. You know, we use half of our parking lot when they're in session uh, to be able to provide parking for Front Range. And we've been praying about how we can, how we can minister to this community that's right next door to us for years. And so Timmy came and said, hey, Rick, we want to be able to begin engaging Front Range and is that something that you could have the journey pray about and then be able to figure out maybe something to partner with? So put that before you and be able to say, start praying about that if you would, about a conditional partnership with uh, St. Vrain Young Life and potentially the work that they do with Front Range Community College. One of the things that we do as well every week is that we uh, not only pray for each other as a community, you can get to those prayer concerns uh, every week through both Journey Jottings and the email that comes out with that, uh, our prayer email. If you want to get receive those uh, two things and send an email to glenda at glenda at journeyoflongmont.org or info at journeyoflongmont.org, and we'll make sure that you get connected to the journey that way. Uh, but through those prayer requests, those prayer requests go out through the journey, and then during our prayer time, that immediately follows the message then those prayer requests are also up on the screen. And uh, we spend time, obviously, praying about the things that God puts before us during that time, but we want to be able to pray for the folks that are in our community. We also, every week, pray for two churches, one that is local here in town and one that is a part of our, uh, our region as a part of our denomination. We're part of a small denomination called the Christian Reformed Church in North America. And uh, we've got churches here in Colorado, a couple in Kansas, and a bunch down in Texas, and that's our region. So today, we're praying for um, Faith Community Lutheran Church, which is up on Highway 66. Uh, Dan Hansen and Lucas Kinzer are the pastors there, and uh, glad to be able to partner with them in ministry here in town. Uh, I also get to work with those guys as chaplains with the uh, Longmont Police and Fire, so glad to be able to, uh, to be brothers and sisters in the gospel with those folks here in Longmont. And then we're praying this week for the Denver Christian uh, Indian Center. And the Denver Christian Indian Center has been working and serving the Native American population of the metro Denver area for about 40 years now. And so we continue to pray for the work that Richard Silversmith is doing uh, and his team with the Christian Ministry, uh, Christian Indian Center. So we're glad to be able to be praying for those folks this morning. Well, with all of that, my friends, uh, why don't we take an opportunity and bring the rest of the service to God in prayer, and then we'll jump into his word and see what God has to say to us this morning. Pray with me. God, thank you so much again that we get to be here, that we get to sing your praises, that we get to know that you are with us in this moment, wherever we are. Just the beauty of that, to think about that for this moment, that 
all of us are, are watching this service on different devices, and yet your Holy Spirit is with us in that moment and drawing us together as your body. What a gift that is. And God, we recognize that all across this city, all across this metro area, all across this state and this country and this world are churches that are doing the exact same thing, gathering together to worship you. And you're doing the exact same thing with those churches and that you're meeting both communities and individuals in those moments to draw folks to you and have them encounter you. And so, Lord, we pray this morning that you be with our brothers and sisters at Faith Community Lutheran Church, that they'll encounter you this morning and that you continue to bless that ministry as it reaches out and, uh, and impacts this city and this county with your gospel. And Lord, we pray for Richard Silversmith and his team and the folks that are working at the Denver Christian Ministry, or Denver Christian uh, Indian Center, and the work that they have with, uh, with their target group of uh, Native Americans here in the metro area. We pray for a blessing on them and that they might uh, be just sensitive stewards of your gospel to our brothers and sisters in that community and those who need you. With that, Lord, we bring the rest of this time to you, and we pray that you open up our ears to hear what you want us to hear. These are your, this is out of your word, Lord, and that's what we want. We want to encounter you and, your, and hear your words. So speak to us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So who died and made you king? You ever hear that line? I've been, uh, been watching the Oceans 11, 12, and 13 movies on Netflix because that's there. And Sorry, I get caught up in those movies. I love them. They're fun. But there's a, there's a line in there in one of the last ones where Danny's off in jail and, and uh, Linus is making some suggestions. And somebody's like, who died and made you Danny? So I've been using that a little bit, right? Who died and made you Danny? Who died and made you king? Right? That, that always comes up, you know, we know the meaning of it. We're a group, a group of peers and nobody's really in charge and then somebody takes it upon themselves to start handing out orders and then somebody's like, who died and made you king? The funny thing is that is exactly the question that got asked Moses in Exodus chapter 2. We're continuing in our series of Exodus that we started a couple of weeks ago and uh, we're picking up the story of Moses in Exodus chapter 2. We're going to go from chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 11, all the way through chapter 3, 13. So it's a bit of a story. I'm going to ask you to hang on. and You can follow along. Uh, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, where you can sit and listen. But one of the things, before I do this, one of the things I want to encourage you to do is every week in Jottings, I'm going to be giving a chunk of passage that we're going to be reading because Exodus has got a long narrative passages. And some of them might be longer than what I'm going to be reading on a Sunday morning. But um, I just want to encourage you to be aware of uh, the passages that are coming and take an opportunity to be able to read those or listen to those ahead of time. So picking it up, Exodus chapter 2, beginning at verse 11, the Word of God. Many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. And after looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. The next day, when Moses went out to visit his people, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why, why are you beating up your friend? Moses said to the one who started the fight. And the man replied, Who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Oh. And Moses was afraid. He thought, oh, everyone knows what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard about what happened, and he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. When Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down beside a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters who came as usual to draw water and fill the water troughs for their father's flocks. But some other shepherds came and chased them away. So Moses jumped up and rescued the girls from the shepherds. And then he drew water for their flocks. When the girls returned to Ruah, their father, he asked, why are you back so soon today? 
An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, they answered, and then he drew water for us and watered our flocks. Well, then where is he? Their father asked. Why did you leave him there? Invite him to come and eat with us. And so Moses accepted the invitation, and he settled there with them. In time, Ruel gave Moses his daughter Zipporah to be his wife. Later, she gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, for he explained, I've been a foreigner in a foreign land. Years passed, and the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant, promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, same guy, different name. And he led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flame, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called out from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here am I, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you're standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I've certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt, and I've heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, a land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look. The cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I've seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested, who, who am I to appear to Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this very mountain. Last week we saw that uh, God has been prepping Moses to be the person that he used to bring children out of Egypt into the promised land. And God's been prepping Moses from the time he was born. That was going on, that what was going on with Israel and Egypt and later what was happening between Moses and Pharaoh is the physical battle that's reflecting the spiritual battle that's going on between God and Satan. This is the big picture of the history of our world in microcosm. There's a lot of us that know the story of Moses. And if you don't know the story of Moses, hang tight because it's a doozy. But for a lot of us, we know the story of Moses. We know who he is. We know his identity as the central figure of the Old Testament for the Jewish community and certainly a central figure for Christian community. And yet like all of us, and here's the thing, like all of us, Moses doesn't start out as the person he became. I mean, we all know Moses, and we think, Moses, you know, Ten Commandments. And uh, well, who's the actor? Charlton Heston. You know, <laughs> it might not be a good example, but, you know, we have this idea of Moses, and yet he doesn't start out that way. In fact, like most of us, he seems to be pretty unsure of who he is. 
And, and in the middle of all that, in the middle of him being unsure of who he is, God calls him, redeems him really, to do, as Paul would later say, to do the work that God had prepared in advance for him to do. Same as God has done for us. So this week we pick up this story of Moses uh, when he's 40 years old. That's according to Stephen, at least in Acts chapter 7. He's 40 years old now. And he's lived as an Egyptian somewhere between, you know, 36 and 38 years. We don't know how long his mom nursed him. You know, two, three, maybe four years before she gave him back to Pharaoh's daughter to, to be raised in Pharaoh's court, to be raised in the royal court, to be raised as one of the Egyptian princes, adopted as he was. But did you notice how this passage started? If you remember from last week, we ended last week with, and later, the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, adopted him, and she adopted him as her own son. And she named him Moses because I lifted him up out of the water. And then boom, many years later, when Moses was grown, this is what it says, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews. And then he saw an Egyptian beating one of his own fellow Hebrews. In fact, in Hebrew, in the, the, the language, it says, and he went to see his brothers. He went out to see his brothers. And then he saw one of the Egyptians beating his brothers. You catch the language there? Moses, the child that was drawn up out of the River Nile and adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and raised in the royal palace as an Egyptian, sees himself as a Hebrew. And maybe that's because we don't know this. There's, there's a pretty large gap here of information, but maybe he's one of those things where it's like all of his siblings do what we all do our, to our siblings. You know, you're adopted. But he really was. And maybe they never let him forget it. Or maybe it's one of those things that he had actually grown up long enough in his family's family to be reminded that he was a Hebrew. Or maybe he still had contact. We have no idea what it was, but the point is, is that he immediately goes in this story to identifying with his Hebrew brothers, with his people. So much so that when he sees one of his own being beaten by one of his, by one of his own and his adopted identity, he chose to side with his birth family and he commits murder to protect his brother, his fellow Hebrew. One of the things I found interesting about that little piece right there, that Moses committed murder, there's a, a lot of commentaries that, uh, that kind of go back to even the Jewish tradition that, that kind of say, you know, well, this is, it was okay that Moses did this because it was the first time he was acting as Israel's protector, the first time that he was acting out in this role that God had given him. And so it was that first time that he was acting as the one who would stand up for Israel's injustice against Egypt. And I thought, okay, I understand that. You know, there's kind of that backward interpretation of this. And yet what struck me about this is that Moses did not see himself in that role. Moses did not see himself as one who was standing up for the injustice of Israel and siding with Israel and being able to make a statement about justice. And you know why we know that that's not the case? Is because the very first thing he did, as Scripture says, is he looked around to make sure no one was looking. And then he killed the guy, and then he buried him in the sand. So it's not like he was like, this is wrong, and I will show you the injustice of what's going on, and I will be Israel's liberator, and kills the Egyptian and stands him up as the dead guy and goes, see, this is what will happen to you if you do not let Israel... He doesn't do that. He's like, bam! Help me bury this guy. Not exactly the picture of the hero. And then the next day, right? Next day, he finds a couple of his fellow... Hebrew brothers fighting, and he goes to the one who started it. It's like, what are you doing? What are you, look, look, 
look, we, we, we got enough problem here with, like, you know, we got to stand together here. As he's more than likely dressed as an Egyptian, certainly looks like an Egyptian. And then the guy's like, what are you going to do? Kill me too? Who died and made you king? And that scares Moses. And he's like, oh man, what I thought I did in secret, somebody's going to find out, Pharaoh's going to find out. Sure enough, Pharaoh finds out, and he books it. And he runs, and he heads off to Midian. Here's the thing. I know this story so well. I grew up on this story. I've preached this story before. I've I've read this story in my devotions and my kids' devotions. I know it so well, and, I've, and I realized something this week is that I've always looked at this story from the ending to the beginning. I've always looked at Moses in this part of the story kind of through the lens of what I know he's going to become. This week I read the story as it progressed and I realized something for the first time that Moses was dealing with what many of us deal with. And it's that question of who am I? It's not like it's, you know, this isn't a psychology text, right? We, we know that this is the word of God that's relaying a story. And yet there's something that you see that comes under the current in which in, in this story as it's unfolding, Moses is trying to figure out who he is. I'm a Hebrew, but I'm an Egyptian. And, and so and we're, how does this work together? Who, who am I? And, and as he runs from Egypt to Midian, which, by the way, is way out in the middle of nowhere, you get the impression that he is a conflicted guy. He's a Hebrew, but he's not a slave. He's an Egyptian, but not by birth. And it's interesting because when the shepherd girls describe them to their dad, this Egyptian helped us, not a Hebrew, notice. When this Egyptian helped us, nobody corrected that description of Moses. He's a protector. But it's also what made him a murderer and a fugitive. But he's also a protector against injustice because he saw what those shepherd guys did to the shepherd girls and was like, this isn't right. And you're like, what, did he take the whole group on? Uh, he was born or he was raised in uh, Pharaoh's household. You can guarantee that he got trained uh, in the fine arts of the military. I'm sure he handled those guys just fine. But he did it without killing. I move in the right direction. But then this last one is he's a man without a country. Because he ends up living with Jethro, marrying Jethro's daughter. They have a son, and he names his son Gershom. Because I am an alien in a foreign land. I am a sojourner in a land that is not mine. I am a person who doesn't belong. Who died and made you king? Apparently nobody because I'm a nobody. Think about that for a minute. We always think of Moses as one of the most significant somebodies. Right? In the New Testament, when Jesus is in the, is in the Mount of Transfiguration with his disciples, it's Moses and Elijah that show up. He's a big deal. And yet here he is, naming his son, I'm a nobody in a no place. I'm a sojourner, an alien in a foreign land. And for the next 40 years, that's who he is. He's not the man that was drawn up out of the water. He is a foreigner in a foreign land. He's defined himself. Maybe by his bad decisions. Certainly by what he is not. And those negative things 
He's defined himself by those negative things that have brought him to where he is. And as I thought about that, I was like, we can all relate to that, can't we? I mean, how many of us have a faulty self-definition? How many of us have those lousy recordings, those old recordings in our head that when, that when things aren't going well, that's what we go to. The old hurts, the old wounds, the things that people have said about us or the things that we have done, the mistakes that we have made where we are defined by the bad decisions that we have made and we allow those bad decisions to define us. We find ourselves in our own place of like, who am I? What worth do I have? You know, I think I was 40 years old before I began finally to feel comfortable in my own skin where I wasn't constantly trying to prove my worth to somebody else because I didn't feel like I had worth or that my worth wasn't self-evident. So you're constantly trying to prove it. I mean, finally at 40, finally at 40, I was actually able to say at one point, you know, we, were, we were doing our worship services at Westview Middle School. My parents had come to visit, and uh, it was one of those services where, um, you know, it, I, it, was, it was typical journey service. And there's this part of me that's always been like, you know, I want my dad to be proud of me. I want my dad to like what I'm doing. And I was driving home. I had this thought, and I was like, you know, for the first time in my life at 40, it doesn't, in this moment, it doesn't matter what my dad thinks of me. Doesn't matter what he thinks of the service. The service isn't for him. My dad is a solid, believing man. This church was not designed for him. It was designed for people who were seeking God. People who were trying to figure this thing out, trying to figure out Jesus, trying to figure out life, trying to figure out hurts and pains. And if this church didn't fit my dad's needs or what he thought church should be, it didn't matter because I w he wasn't my audience. God had brought us here to do something different than that. He brought us here to, to be that safe place where people could figure out Jesus at their own pace. And I was driving home, and I'm like, wow. I am actually free from caring what my dad thinks about me. At 40. Now I'm 56. And I'm probably comfortable with 80% of who I am. Still working on that. And yet I'm amazed at how much I'm still impacted by those old recordings, those old negative thoughts, those experiences that have shaped my self-protection, uh, perception. So much so that, I, that I'm not always open to hearing what God thinks of me. And then I'm amazed that Moses, that Moses, seems to have had the same issue. Just a guy who has a self-definition based on bad decisions and some faulty ideas of who he is. And then God shows up in a burning bush. <laughs> that must have been crazy to show up and see this bush and then have a voice come out. Moses, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. That must have been something. And then in the middle of that moment, God lays out his plan. He has heard the cries of his people and he is going to rescue them and he is sending Moses to bring them out. And Moses said, who am I? Nobody died and made me king. God, you don't get it. I don't belong there. I killed a guy. I am a shepherd. I am a nobody in the middle of nowhere. You can hear it, can't you? And maybe you felt that way yourself. What have I got to offer? What abilities do I have? I don't belong. I'm a, 
nobody in the middle of nowhere and I've got the memories of my pain and disapproval of others to prove it. And yet, what did God do? What does God do in this moment? Does God say, what do you mean? No, Moses, I've been working on you and preparing on you in this moment your entire life. You've got everything you need. I've given you everything you need from the Nile to the palace to the desert. And in some respects, when we look at Moses' life, that's exactly what God's been doing. Uh, You're going to lead a nation of 2.5 to 3 million people. You need to be a strong leader. You need to know how to lead. Hey, growing up in Pharaoh's household gives you a whole lot of training in that regard. You're going to shepherd people through a wilderness, and you've just spent the last 40 years shepherding sheep through a wilderness. And you know the wilderness. I mean, there's a sense where God could have said this, like, no, no, I've been working on you. I've been working on your gifts, working on your skills, getting you ready. No, you got this. No, that's not what he says, is it? When Moses is like, who who am I? God says, I will be with you. Not look at everything I've given you, look at all the skill sets, look at at how I've arranged everything. This simple. I will be with you. There are two things I think that are worth noting here. And the first one is this, and it's really critically important that we remember it. Moses is not the one who's doing the rescuing. God is. God is doing the rescuing. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Israel. I have heard the cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. And yes, I am aware of their suffering. And so I'm coming down. I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites and Hittites and Amorites and Perizzites and Hivites and the Jebusites live. Look, look, the cry of the people of Israel have reached me. I've seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, I'm sending you. I'm rescuing my people, but I'm inviting you along for the ride. This is the, this is the thing that always blows me away about God. God could do, we believe this, God could do whatever he wants to do. And yet, in his sovereignty, he has always chosen to redeem his people, his creation, by asking others to participate, by asking us to participate. And he's just done this with Moses. God is the one who is doing the rescuing, but he just invited Moses to partner with him in carrying out. And, I, and why is this so important to remember? It's so important to remember because this is not a battle of wills between Moses and Pharaoh. This is a battle of will between God and Satan that's getting played out on this plane. But this is good versus evil. This is God and the one who wants to be God and dethrone God. And let's not mistake this. We believe that God is the ultimate power and he has defeated Satan and yet Satan is no lightweight. The New Testament talks about a roaring lion that's been chained. That's not a picture of a wuss. That's a picture of something dangerous. And so there is something dangerous going on here. There is a battle of good and evil that is getting played out between Moses and Pharaoh and Israel and Egypt. And God is the one who is doing the fighting. But he is using Moses to draw the attention to where the fight is. So that's the first thing we have to realize, is that God is doing the rescuing. God is doing the fighting. which is a good thing because when Moses is looking at his resume, 
he doesn't feel too impressed by it and tells God that. When he says, who am I? And God says, don't worry about who you are. I will be with you. I will be with you. The God who is the one who is rescuing his people out of slavery in Egypt is the God who is working at redeeming all of creation. And rescuing us from the slavery of sin. And that's why these two things are so important to remember that it is God who is doing the fighting and he is the one who is with us. That's what that is, the cross. It is the symbol to remind us that this is not our fight, it is God's fight and he's the one that took it on and he's the one that did it. He's the one that is in the process of redeeming this world and the beauty of what God did with Moses he does with us. He invites us along. And what do we need to do that? To know that God's with us. This is not your battle or my battle to fight for God. What happens in this world, the rescuing of this world and the people that are in it, it's not dependent on your abilities or my abilities, your gifts or my gifts, your plans or my plans. What we bring to the table will not shift the tide of God's plan for rescuing the world. God is rescuing the world. He just invited Moses and you and me to participate in it. And don't think for one second that your bad decisions or your faulty self-description disqualifies you from being an instrument of God as he seeks to rescue this world. Don't you take that lie for a minute Because he's with you. He's with us. And he wants us to participate in his redeeming of this world. He took a guy like Moses and put him front and center. And while we may not be Moses, it doesn't mean that God doesn't want to use us or work through us as he carries out his plan. Who died and made you king? Turns out, though Moses didn't know it at the time, God did. Who made you ruler and judge over us? We'll have this conversation in 40 years. But it's not because of Moses. It's because of God. And ultimately, Moses' willingness to be used by God in this way. And now we get to be a part of his plan. We get to be a part of what he's doing in this world. So don't let your view of yourself get in the way of how God might use you as he seeks to redeem this world. We're going to spend some time praying in a moment. And it was uh, amazing as I was uh, just thinking about how to lead us into prayer about this. Scott Tillion sent something out to uh, a text, Men on the Journey. And... Uh, and it just really resonated with me, and the timing was so apt. And I thought, here are words to lead us into prayer about seeing ourselves for who God sees us to be, to recognize that this is God's plan that he's carrying out, but to remember that we get to be a part of it 
So to, to seek to follow his will, even if we don't have an idea of where it might lead us. So as we get ready to spend some time in prayer together and individually, let these words resonate. And then take yourself to God and let him speak to you about how he sees you. Oh, Lord, my God, oh, these words are from uh, Thomas Burton. Oh, Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. And I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I'm following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing it. But I believe that the desire to please you does, in fact, please you. And I hope I have the desire in all that I'm doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you'll lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are ever with me and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Lord, you know each of us this morning. How many of us have no idea where we're going? And we don't see the road ahead of us. The Lord, meet us in these next moments to know that you're with us and that you never leave us. Hear our prayers, Lord.
Dear God, we thank you this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the example of Moses. Lord, and all that it can teach us. It's so wonderful to know that you are with us wherever we're headed, wherever we're growing towards, that you are there. Lord, we need to know, we need to feel that you are there, to feel your arms around us, to know that you're there to shield us and shelter us, and Lord, many times to carry us where we need to go. Lord, today, make your presence known to us, to each and every one of us, that we may feel you, we may know you, so that we may worship you as you deserve, love your people as you would like, and worship and praise your son, Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Go ahead and stand as we continue to worship. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught. My heart to fear and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone.
co-worker, that you call us partner in your ministry, and that you are with us. God, that has been, that has been your promise from the get-go, that you are a God who is with us, that you are a God that comes down to us, that you are a God that never lets us go, that you hear us when we're crying out and you answer rescue so that you can be with us. God, this week as we get ready to leave this place, to leave our spaces where we are, to know that every place we go, every step we take, you're there 
with us every step of the way. Let us go in that today, Lord. And we pray this in the power of your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, it was great to be able to worship with you today. We hope you have a really great day. And with that, may you go in the grace of God, in the love of the Son, with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Go in his name. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God.